Good morning. What's up? What's up? Please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 7. We're going to get right into this. Starting in verse 1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds, and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. And the floodgates of the heavens were open, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah and his son Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moved along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind. Everything with wings, pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them. Then came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing. As God had commanded Noah, then the Lord shut him in. The 40 days, 440 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. This was cataloged by Moses. He was not there during these events, but the Spirit prompted him to record this for Israel. In fact, the Old Testament, the Torah, and the Tanakh is replete with continual callbacks of days of yore. God would reveal himself by saying that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he would constantly recall and help to remember all the exploits of times long past. Now, for us, when we read Genesis, we think ancient history. Funny enough, the original audience, when they saw Genesis, they also thought of ancient history. And they were constantly bombarded of remembering, recalling, you know. And today, we're no different, you know. When we talk about throwback Thursdays and and, and back in the day, Right? We are fascinated with what happened prior than today. And if you want any proof of that, you just got to see the music that we listen to. Right? Now, I went to lyrics.com, and I put the word memory, and I found some interesting stats. There are at least 34,968 lyrics 
with the word memory in them. Right? There's at least seven artists with the word memory in their names and a hundred albums that have the word memory in the title of their album. Right? So we're constantly singing about remembering things. And it crosses across all types of different genres. I mean, you know, Tri Cold Quest, back in the days of the Boulevard of Linden, we used to cook with teens and the presence was fitting. I know some of you remember that. That's the stuff right. You know, you know, you got the album. You got the album. Right? But also we have, you know, Barbra Streisand. You know, and the way we were when Babs would say memories, light the corners of my mind, misty water colored memories of the way we were. And back in the, you know, in the reggae side of town, Beanie Man would talk about memories don't live like people do. They always remember you. Whether things are good or bad, it's just the memories that you have. Anybody? No one? No one? No one? Okay. And Bob Hope, when he would end every show, he would sing this same song. Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse, nothing in my purse, and chuckles when the preacher said for better or for worse, how lovely it was. And of course, we take it back to the West Coast in the 90s. Ahmad talked about back in the days when I was young, I'm not a kid anymore. But some days I said, I wish I was a kid again. Back in the days when I was young, I'm not a kid anymore. But some days I said, and wish I was a kid again. You know, we're always talking about back in the day and remembering what happened. But why does the Bible keep doing that to us? Why does the Bible keep having these flashback scenes? Right? I'm glad you asked that question. Because in Romans 15, verse 4, says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that provide, we might have hope. But how does this apply to the verse that we just read today? How is this cataclysmic event going to teach us to have encouragement and have hope? Because some of us, you know, when people talk about the Bible, talk down about the Bible, the detractors, they will say, how can a loving God with all his furious anger wipe humanity? Right. right? We hear this a lot to a point where we believe that that's exactly what the Bible says. And we fall into this thing that John's been talking about throughout the series, the lullaby effect. We think that's the case. We think that's true. The guy just got tight and had enough of us and got rid of us. But when you look at chapter 6, the Bible tells you exactly what happened. That God was brokenhearted with humanity. And that humanity wickedness was so depraved that that sin was not only sanitized, it was standardized. When they were doing it for the culture, they were sinning. They were doing it for the culture. And prior to the flood, there was already an extension level event in process. And it was the humans who were the culpable agents of their own demise. They were the ones that were eating themselves up alive. And God intervened with a flood. Now, in How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Defee, he says narratives are stories. Purposeful, purposeful stories retelling the historical events of the past and are intended to give meaning and direction for a given people in the present. All narratives are selective and incomplete. Not all the relevant details are always given. What does appear in the narrative is everything that the inspired author thought important for us to know. So this flood, which is a historical event, we don't get a play-by-play -play breakdown of this event. Right? Moses writes specific flashbacks because there's certain theological truths that he wanted his people to remember, right? And it's the same for us today. Now, we want to remember what they remembered, right? So we have, we have to understand the cultural context, the, the, the linguistical context, so that we can properly exegete the text, so that we can have a proper hermeneutic. And I know I used a lot of $20 words right now, <laughs> right? But basically, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the man, the boat, and the sea. And what does that really mean? The man, the boat, and the sea, and what that really means. To the original audience, 
so that we can have a proper understanding of what Moses was trying to convey when he recorded this cataclysmic event. So are you with me? Yes, sir. People in the back, you with me? Yes. We good? All right. So let's go. We're going to start with the man, Noah, or Noah. Right? You got to get that, that thing in your throat, Noah. Noah. His name means rest. Genesis 5, 29. He named him Noah and said he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. No pressure, huh, Noah? And as we know, names meant everything in the ancient Near East. The word name in Hebrew was Shem. It's presence. The thing that makes you you. The thing that makes you tick. That's what you are. So when they had Noah, they thought rest and comfort. And he lived up to his name. Because in Genesis 7, verse 1, it says, The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. The word righteous here is sadiq. Noah, Noah, is the first person to be called sadiq in the Bible. He is the first human to be called righteous. Now, we know what the word righteous means at this point. We know it's doing what's right in God's sight. But what exactly did Noah did that deemed him to have this title of Sadiq? Right? Hebrews 11, <coughs> verse 7. It says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things yet not seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And we know now that faith is not blind faith. It is a conviction born from things that you believe and experience to be true. So Noah experienced holy fear. And in the Greek here, it means to have reverence. Showing pious care, reverent circumspection, which is the quality of being worried and unwilling to take risks. So Noah was righteous because he believed that not listening to Yahweh was risky business. If I don't follow God, if I don't pledge my allegiance to God, I'm in trouble. But it wasn't just that, right? In 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and serving others. So not only did he have a reverent fear for God, he talked about having a reverent fear for God in his generation. He didn't keep it to himself. He spoke about it. He's like, listen, what you guys are doing, it's kind of risky. You might want to put that down. It's not a good look for you right now. I'm just saying, me and God, you know, I think God's the way to go here. You know, he talked about it. He expressed his allegiance with Yahweh. And because of his holy fear, he was able to avoid so much trouble. Now, me personally, you know, I know what it means to have reverent fear. All right. Because some of you may or may not know, you know, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. Anybody from Brooklyn? Brooklyn's in the house, no doubt, no doubt. And I come from Gowana's houses, which people just call the projects, right? We call it GP Rock, right? GP Rock. And, you know, it was a great place, but there was also a lot of depravity happening as well. Because I came of age during the crack era. You know, and anybody who was a native New Yorker in the 80s who lived here know how severe that time was. And how all these new temptations were created that anyone could get swept up in the depravity. You know, I was also tempted, but I had developed a reverent fear for my parents. <laughs> and the instrument that was mostly used for this reverent fear was the chancleta, better known to most of you as a slipper. Now, for most of you, a slipper is just something you wear in your house. But in the hands of an Hispanic mother, it is a semi-automatic weapon 
with lethal accuracy. Now, I'm not condoning, you know, child abuse or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not scarred, you know. But I was put in line, you know. Because, you know, I was a little rebellious when I was growing up. Just a little. I mean, you got to talk to your mom. This, my mom to see if that's 100% true. But the way I saw it, I wasn't that bad of a kid, right? But the one thing I did have a problem with was curfew. Because none of my friends had curfew. They just was out in the streets as much as they want. I had to be home the minute those street lights went up. Some of you can relate, right? <coughs> Which is a bum in the wintertime because those lights go up at like four something, right? I hated it with a passion, right? My parents are limiting my liberty. I'm feeling oppressed. I need freedom. So one day, I don't know if I did it by mistake or maybe in the back of my mind, I want to just be rebellious. I was two hours late past curfew. I knew I had problems coming my way. So I went up, you know, I went home, opened the door. The lights are out. My parents are not in the living room like they usually are. They went to bed early tonight. I'm like, yes, I'm getting away with this. This is so dope, yes. So I slowly creep past their door, get to my room. I open the door gently, go in. I close the door to my room, basking in the victory of getting away with murder. I put the light on, and my mom is standing on top of my bed. All four feet 11 of her with the chancleta. Now, I don't know if she was there all night waiting or when she heard the keys, she ran into the room and took position. The minute I walk, I look back, there's the chancla and she swoops down. And what messed me up wasn't the chancleta, it was me getting ambushed. I was not expecting that. And I told mom, listen, beat me all you want, just don't ever do that again. That was crazy. But I learned reverent fear from that. I was never late again. In fact, there's a lot of things that I did out of reverent fear that I didn't want to do. I did my homework because of reverent fear. I did well in school because of reverent fear. I didn't get caught up in any criminal activity, not because of the cops, but because the cops would tell my mom. And then by the time I was old enough to not get hit the John Collector, well, my mom will still tell you today that if I act up, she'll get on the chair and, you know. But by the time I was, in, I was 19, where I can really do what I want to do, I found Jesus. And I learned reverent fear in God. And it's because of that, I was not a statistic in the projects. I avoided a lot of nonsense and a lot of problems because I had reverent fear. And that's the thing that they learned when they heard about Noah. Yes. A man had reverent fear. And when you do that, you avoid the nonsense that circulates the world around you. That's right. And that's what we learned from the man. Yes. So now, let's talk about the boat. Yes. Now, the people who first heard this story would not think of the ark as a boat at all. It says, whereas in the 19th century, it was often thought that the term Teba was of Mesopotamian origin. The scholarly consensus today is that it is more than likely Egyptian. According to the major Hebrew lexicons, Teba can either mean A, shrine, sarcophagus, or B, box, or chest. Kasuto argued that it was an Egyptian word denoting a coffin or a chest in general, and also a big building such as a palace and the like. Significantly, Makutki states that the term Teba is definitely Egyptian, and that it has a meaning of shrine since the old kingdom. What's more, he goes on to argue that the, world has no, the word has no cognate in Semitic strengthening the etymology. It was not a boat to these people. It was a floating palace. It was a shrine. And if you know anything about the ancient Near East, this is where you would put your god, your idol, into a shrine. You know, when you look at ancient Egypt, you see some of those temples still 
standing, like the temple of Karnak. And those who are not as rich as the Pharaoh will have a special sacred space in their house, and they will build an altar and shrine for their God. Because that was the place where they put the most precious thing in their lives in. But what does Yahweh do? Yahweh tells Noah, I need you to build a shrine. Because I want to put what I think is the most precious thing in my world. And that's you. During this cataclysmic flood, God decided to create a shrine to preserve humanity. The very humanity that he was exacting divine judgment on. I want you to think about that. They were rebellious. God saw their rebellion. God dealt with their rebellion. But while he was dealing with their rebellion, he still gave them mercy. He still preserved them. And it makes me think of Romans 5, starting in verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And we see this pattern throughout the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve rebel. God exacts judgment by kicking them out of paradise. But as they're going, they get parting gifts. They get clothes to, to shield them from the nakedness that they incurred on themselves. You know, Cain, first murderer recorded in the Bible. He gets banished, but God makes sure that no one could do to him what he did to his own brother. And in this flood, this horrific event, wiping away humanity, God still takes the time out to preserve humanity. And for us, you know, if you're visiting or you're just studying right now, you might be in a really bad predicament, you know. And it might be because of what you've done, you know. And you're dealing with the repercussions of those things right now. But as of right now, as jacked up as you are, God wants to preserve you. Amen. You know, a lot of times, you know, you, you invite someone to church. and It's like, man, you don't want me to go to your church. The minute I step in, the whole place is going to be ablaze. I'm just such a wicked man, you know. But they don't know that the only place that doesn't go up in smoke is God's kingdom. Amen. So you're in the right place. Amen. You know, and for those of us who have made the commitment to, to, to be in pledge with Yahweh, you know, we might have done some things right now that are not Christ-like. And we're suffering the repercussions of those actions today. Even you, today, God still wants to preserve you. How do I know that? You're, you're breathing now, right? Yeah. A lot of people can't say that this morning. You're still here. God's not done with you yet. He wants to preserve you because he deems you most special in his sight. And lastly, the sea. In Babylonian, Canaanite, and Egyptian literature, the sea represents an element of chaos. The Mesopotamian Sea is personified in the Akkadian deity Tiamat. The Egyptian Chaos Ocean is personified in Nun. And the Canaanite Sea is personified in Yom, the enemy of Baal. In the creation account in Genesis, the sea is a primordial element, but is neither deified nor personified. The Tehom represents chaos only as disorder, not as a threatening, combative enemy, as Tiamat becomes in the Amunna Elish, nor as the source from creation emerges, as in Egypt. When the people of the ancient Near East thought of the sea, they thought chaos. They thought confusion. Right? They thought of all just, just turmoil and things just not making sense. You know? And that's not just for those days, but for today as well. We have Malcolm Muggeridge, a, a British journalist, commenting on the modern day era. And it's confusion. He says, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that the 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. 
He himself blows the trumpet that brings down the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last, having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he kneels over a weary old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. The world is full of turmoil and confusion. But what do we learn about Noah? Because of his reverent fear, God preserved him in a shrine, and he literally rises above the confusion. The chaos is all around him. It doesn't seep in in the tabir. He's protected from it. It's there. It's around. Everywhere he looks, all he can't see is chaos and confusion. But he's only a witness to it and not a victim to it. That's what we could learn today from Noah as well. If we have a holy fear, if we pledge our allegiance to Yahweh, we can literally rise above it all if you decide to truly be in allegiance with God. So the takeaway of Genesis 7 isn't that God is a mean, spirited dictator who's just had it up to here with you, and he's done. That's not the takeaway. The takeaway is your sin does not stop his love. That's what the flood's all about. Yes, God is just. He will deal with what you've done. But it does not mean he loves you any less. It doesn't mean he loves you any less. He loves you as jacked up as you currently are right now in those chairs, as many times as you rebel and sin against them on purpose, he still loves you. Now, there might be some, you know, some, some chancletas coming your way, some pow pows from God. That might be happening to you. Does not mean he stopped loving you. In fact, it's because he loves you that these things sometimes occur. You know, he is justice, but he's also merciful. So what we need to do now is take the Noah challenge. So what I need you guys to do is go on your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, and I want you to hashtag, hashtag the Noah challenge. And when someone asks you what is the Noah challenge, you give them the scripture. First Peter 3, starting in verse 20. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The same pledge that Noah made Back in the Bronze Age, it's the same pledge we need to make today. That we will learn to have a faith, to develop a conviction, to really believe that not listening to God is risky business. We need to learn that. If you're visiting today, please take the Noah challenge. Please learn what it means to have holy fear. Learn how to rise above the chaos that's that's currently flooding your world and your timelines and your families so that you can rise above it all. And for those of us who have already made the pledge, renew your pledge today. Remember who you are in Christ. That you are also a Sadiq. Not for anything you've done, but because of what Christ has done for you. And as we take communion, that is the thing that we have to Keep in mind that because of his blood and his sacrifice, we rise above the flood of confusion, and God preserves us in his tabir, in his son. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for though we are horrible and wretched, you still provide mercy for us while divine judgment is occurring. We are not 
you know, we, we don't deserve to be embraced and put in your tabir. But yet you have created one so that if anyone wants to leave the confusion, they just need to enter your arms. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. And thank you for giving us this day, this, this first day of the week, where we could just stop thinking about everything else and focus on you and what you've done for us and how you have saved us from the sea, from the confusion, from the rebellion, God, so that we can have you and you can protect us as long as we're in your arms. Thank you so much for this time. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.